Okay, so welcome uh, everyone to this uh, new session of uh, the Development Studies uh, Seminars. My name is Alessandra Mezzadri and I teach in the Department of Development Studies. And uh, I have the great pleasure tonight to chair this seminar and introduce our very distinguished guest, uh, Isabel Guerin, uh, who is going to talk about uh, uh, her new book uh, uh, in a moment. I want to say a few words because I have known now Isabel for almost, <laughs> almost 20, 15 for sure, and we don't want to count beyond that. But I've uh, learned so much about her work uh, mm -hmm. that uh, cannot be said uh, in a few words. Uh, she has uh, contributed massively to debates on uh, uh, not just credit and debt, which is uh, the uh, focus of uh, uh, today's uh, seminar, but also in relation of uh, bondage, new bondage, and unfree labor in India. And I think anyone that uh, uh, is focusing on the subcontinent uh, will uh, have read at some point uh, her uh, work. So um, a very special thank you from me for accepting our invitation. I'll now formally introduce uh, uh, Isabel is a senior research fellow at IRD, French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development, and an associate researcher at the Institut Français de Pondichéry. Her research focuses on financialization perpetuates inequalities and its impact on the development of alternatives and solidarity-based initiatives. And she uh, employs a combination of statistical surveys and ethnography, along with a critical analysis of the politics of numbers. Additionally, she is the co-founder and co-director of the Observatory of Rural Dynamics and Social Inequalities in uh, South India. So today, Isabel will focus on her new book, uh, co-published with Santosh Kumar and Venkata Subramanian. Yes, Venkata Subramanian, and it's called The Indebted Woman. Uh, it's uh, a presentation that will take uh, around 40 minutes, after which uh, I will uh, uh, provide a very brief uh, discussant uh, note. We want to maximize the time we spend debating. And uh, after that, I will take questions in rounds of three until, you know, we have uh, uh, juice and stamina left. Uh, that is also when they're going to check, uh, check us out of the room, which I think is 6.30. All right, so Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Good evening to all of you, and thank you so much, Alexandra and Haman and Naomi, for uh, this invitation. It's a pleasure, it's an honor, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Even though we have been, we have, we had, we have has, had some sort of collaboration for a long time, it's the first time for me to do it so us. So it's a great pleasure. One of the last place in Europe with a kind of critical thinking. It's great. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about this co-author book. Uh, co-written with my two Indian colleagues, Santosh Kumar and uh, Venkata Subramanian. So I'm going to, so I, I hope I will give justice to this collective work. And um, yeah, let me start with a question. Um, if I ask you, according to you, uh, who are the main players in finance? What comes to mind? Uh, when I ask the question to my students, or I also did the exercise with my kids, and they were telling me, well, it might be, those wealthy, well-educated, white, white guys living in London or New York and spending their days earning millions of money because of their supposed very sophisticated skills in, in prediction, in playing with algorithms and as uh, hedge fund managers, brokers, or, or whatever, uh, something like this, no? Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is partly true, but uh, this is with, with our, our idea that this is top of the pyramid. If instead we look at the bottom of the pyramid, what we see instead is this. Oops. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. 
Um, and yeah, if you take a look at the bottom of the pyramid, what we see is a completely different figure. It's no longer the financial analyst of the hedge fund manager, but rather what we have called the indebted woman. And uh, the main point of our book is that this indebted woman is uh, has a crucial role in today's financial capitalism. Without her hard work, without uh, everyday work of managing family debt, without the various skills required for this work, without uh, a sense of a strong sense of ethic and guilt, which is uh, deeply ingrained in her identity uh, as a woman, financial capitalism couldn't simply work. So if, if, you, if you fall asleep or if you are struggling to understand my French accent, or if I if you get lost, just remember this. This is the main argument. <laughs> um, so let me try to explain how we have come to the conclusion. Um, two pictures. Yeah. So the of this Yeah. So uh, let me try to explain how we have come to the conclusion. Um, I'm very bad with techniques, and I think I sent the wrong uh, slides. But I initially I had the slide with pictures at the global level, uh, mm -hmm. so I'm just going to explain what was what what those figures were about, and showing uh, the, the amount of household debt in different places in France, in the U.S., in Brazil, in India, in, in South Africa, and I mean the amount of debt is different depending upon the places, but there is a common trend: it's booming everywhere, right? it's increasing. What was missing in those figures is disaggregated uh, data by gender, and uh, which may explain why expert, uh, apart few experts or few uh, few people, uh, nobody cares much about how to, about about the gender of debt, and probably because we don't have any figures, and as we know, uh, things which are not counted do not count. No. Um, so the first part of our work with my two colleagues uh, and focusing on South India was to try to count uh, 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 debt. So we were been using different methods. Uh, so this book is based on 20 years of field work in, in, in a particular region, South Arcot, which is a small region in Tamil Nadu in South East India. Uh, so we've been combining different sorts of methods, uh, statistics. I'm trained as an economist, so as an economist I like numbers. Uh, but I also do think that numbers are very useful. Uh, and this is, uh, this uh, we've been doing what we call panel data. I've been serving a number of households in 2010, 2016, 2020. And I also have to specify that, um, you know, I, I had a few reviews of that book and, and some of uh, the uh, colleagues who've been writing uh, reviews were saying, well, it's a nice book, but it, there is almost no statistics. I would say that it's better to have a uh, few good numbers rather than a large number of bad numbers. And it took us a lot, a lot of time to collect reliable data and debt. It's very tricky for many reasons. And it's also very complicated to collect data disaggregated by gender. So maybe there are not enough data, but at least the few we, that we have, I suspect, are uh, reliable. Um, my two colleagues are trained as social anthropologists, and actually most part of the book is really using ethnography as a way to explore uh, far beyond the numbers, uh, the, the debt subjectivities, and, and also how debt uh, is not only uh, about money, but it's also about many other things, and how it articulates with, with women's bodies, with women's sexuality, with women's intimacy. We've also been using French diaries, you know, tracking uh, inflows and outflows at particular uh, uh, households. Also, again, with disaggregated data uh, along gender lines. And with a particular focus on Dalit women, with the idea that uh, even though the indebted woman uh, is uh, from different classes and class in that particular region, uh, the indebted woman is first and foremost from the Dalit communities. Um, well, it's in some, to some extent, it's a case study with a very particular focus on the micro region. At the same time, we've been trying constantly to move across time and space to see what is specific to Tamil Nadu and what is not specific. And one of our conclusions is to say that this indebted woman, I'm afraid, is all over the place. Yeah. Um, so, what are our, our, our most salient findings? The very first one is to say that, oh, yes, the figure is there. Okay, I stopped. Well, this was the figure that I was talking about. Sorry. 
Um, so the, the very first thing is to say that, as you probably know, uh, feminist research has largely shown that the uh, sexual division of labor is a key component of capitalism. And our argument here is to say that there is also sexual division of debt uh, at the heart of capitalism and financial capitalism in particular. And the sexual division of debt takes different forms. And first, the fact that in a number of places, women and more specifically women from the working classes and from subaltern categories are specialized in specific debt sources, which are most, most expensive and socially degrading. Uh, this can be pawnbroking, I'm talking about uh, industrial Europe in the 19th century, um, and pawning is still very much uh, there in, 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 in many different places. Departments store credit cards, my credit, uh, which is very much part of the story in, in India, uh, pay the lending, uh, subprimes. I mean, we, also, we all know that uh, now uh, that subprimes in uh, both in the US and in Spain, for instance, where uh, women were overrepresented in those kind of uh, uh, debt. And, and moreover, uh, women from um, uh, colored uh, women. Another aspect of this uh, sexual division of debt is the fact that repayment uh, is uh, a female task. And this came out very clearly from the financial diaries. And even when um, debt as, are contracted by male, uh, it's in many cases, women have to pay back the debt of their husbands. Um, this was very clear from our work in South India, but if I just take two other examples, take the case of France, for instance, debt collectors for uh, uh, social housing, uh, um, when, when they are, when, People are late in paying their rent. Uh, debt collectors are targeting women uh, in the first place. Uh, again, if I take subprime loans in Spain at the time of the 2008 crisis, who I mean the uh, number of cases, mortgages were contracted by a couple, but who was bearing the mental and and and, and sometimes the financial burden? Uh, ethnography showed that it was mostly women. Uh, and in a number of ethnographies uh, in many parts of the world show that women are very often at the forefront uh, when it comes to managing overdue bills, when it comes to deal with uh, bailiffs, debt collectors, answering calls from uh, collection agencies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And the last thing is um, quality of debt. In a number of cases, women, when they have to, to be, in order to build their credit worthiness or to pay back their debt, have to use their body and their sexuality. I'll come back to this uh, later. A uh, few figures about uh, debt in this particular region, uh, South Arcot. Uh, just a few figures, uh, many new, I, I'm not going to uh, use many figures, but uh, uh, some of them who I think are quite revealing, debt service, I mean, how much of your income is used for debt repayment? Uh, 44 in 2010, so I, earn, I earn 100, I pay back 44. 48 in 2016, 68 in 2020. So it gives you an idea of how much debt people have. Uh, as a comparison, you can see those figures in those in Australia and France. Uh, cast and class, um, debt burden is increasingly unequal. I mean, it's maybe those, I'm, I'm not sure those graphs are very easy to read, but what you see is that uh, um, over time, uh, uh, the debt burden, uh, uh, debt service ratio is, is worse and worse, especially for Dalits and especially for uh, landless uh, uh, people. Uh, debt linked to gender, uh, if you look at debt to income ratio, uh, you can see the for the poorest, it's, it's quite bad. Then if you compare men and women, it's also uh, the difference is quite revealing. On average, uh, men borrow three times more in their income, and for women, it's nine nine times more in their income. Um, and this debt is mostly used for, and mostly and increasingly used for social reproduction uh, purposes. So investment, it's not completely negligible, but it's not that high, and it's increasing over time. Family expenses, it's mostly food, health, past loans, housing, education, ceremonies. Um, yeah. Um, well, our next argument is to say that uh, if um, this indebted woman is so important, is act as a pillar of capitalism, is in the first place uh, because uh, of the fact that managing debt is a true form of work. 
uh, and when families depend as much or even more on debt and income to make a living, uh, managing this debt is a true form of work. It involves a uh, repetitive and, and time consuming task. We have this figure coming from the financial diary. I'm not going to turn into the details, but we were able, thanks to this method, to measure how many transactions a week men and women are doing to uh, uh, regarding debt management. And it's very clear that for women, uh, the number of transactions is quite high compared to men. Um, um, so time consuming task and uh, a number of skills. I'm going to uh, this in a minute. And this great value, I mean, uh, time consuming task, skills, value creation, this is a definition of work. So that's why we use the term that's why we argue that managing debt is a true form of work. Uh, into skills. Uh, so we are in a situation where not only debt is very high, but people and women in particular juggle with 5, 10, 15, 20 loans at the time, what we've been called juggling. So for instance, a particular woman has been borrowing this E loan, and then to pay back, she's been borrowing from L, and then from AE, and then and, and to pay back L, she's been borrowing from Z. So I, 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 I take a lot from Alexandra, and then to pay back Alexandra, I borrow from you, and then to, to pay you back, I borrow from the end, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this has a number of consequences, uh, cognitive skills, because uh, for most of those debts, there is no written uh, receipts, except for microcredits, but otherwise, um, I mean, I forgot to mention this, but microcredit is only a small part of the story. Phone brokers, uh, employers, neighbors, um, anyone. Uh, in, in your circle is learning you know? uh, So this requires very uh, strong cognitive skills to remember everything. Uh, it requires rational skills to negotiate, to uh, emotional skills, um, sexual skills. I'll come back to this in a minute. And this juggling process also has strong consequences in terms of costs. Right? Because since you have to borrow from many places to pay back one particular debt, at the end of the day, the cost is very high. Um, and here we have one. Uh, yeah, and um, so, uh, and this network, as I was saying earlier, it's creating value, uh, two kinds of value, I would say. The first one is uh, somehow it acts as a kind of indirect subsidy to private capital. I mean, it's precisely because, uh, um, it's precisely because, um, because, sorry, because family can go into debt to uh, meet their basic needs, uh, employers can afford to pay low wages. Mm -hmm. And same way, kind of indirect subsidy to the state, since, as I was saying earlier, part of this debt is used to pay for health education, and it somehow it's acted as a kind of compensation for uh, the failure of the state to provide those kind of services. And then, of course, it's also a significant contribution to the financial industry. And here, an interesting number is this interest debt service. How much part of your income is used uh, to pay back interest? And according to our figure, it's around 30%. I earn 100. Almost one third of this is paid as interest. And 15 as a median, which is quite interesting because it means that um, people and women in particular are more or less productive. Um, yeah. Um, well, we could stop here and conclude that women are an easy target for capitalism, which is understood very well that women were easy clientele, uh, very disciplined and, and very good in, in paying back well. Uh, and this argument is not completely new. We have a number of scholars who have been writing on this already. I have in mind the work by uh, Silvia Federici and Nancy Fraser. Alexandra, you've been working on that also. Um, this famous book by our two colleagues from Argentina, um, Veronica Gago and her, and her co-author. Uh, you have a number of colleagues uh, in India, uh, Sorini Carr, who has done this great work on, 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 on microcredit. Uh, and our argument is to say that uh, uh, thanks to our long-term ethnography, uh, this uh, fieldwork has allowed us to shed light on something else. Um, the idea of what we have called, the, I, or it's very difficult to pronounce this with my French accent, patriarchal debt. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the connection between debt and 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 so this obligation and the fact of being a woman, and even more so the way in which financial capitalism transforms womanhood and transforms bodies and transforms uh, emotions, sentiments, and how this in turn feeds financial capitalism. 
Um, so the, our argument is to say that, yes, capitalism is very much part of the story, but this indebted woman is not only a conspiracy of uh, profit capital. Uh, so what do I mean by this idea of patriarchal debt? Uh, you are probably familiar with uh, the work, famous work by uh, David Graeber, and only the rich pay the debt, the, the debt only the dominant and the, and the rich pay the debt, and, and this idea that the uh, uh, debt creditor asymmetry is uh, the foundation of um, class relation. And the fact that being, on, of being from the working class means that you have to pay uh, your debt. Uh, this idea of debt as a domination tool can also be applied to religion, like work, uh, Christianity, for instance, uh, Hinduism, uh, uh, race. Um, all this work is, uh, uh, well, very grateful to all those authors to have uh, uh, highlighted that debt and the amount to be repaid and obligation are two things which are completely connected. Our argument is to say, very simple, is that we also should add gender in the equation. And with this very simple idea uh, that in many circumstances, being a woman means owing something. I'm a woman and by being a woman, I owe something to my kids, to my spouse, to my family, to my community, and even to the nation as a whole. As if, as if debt as an obligation was somehow in a kind of ontological condition of womanhood. Well, again, we could stop here and consider that patriarchal debt is just something that happens. Um, this is a bit depressing. Mm -hmm. And what is fascinating with the Tamil case is that when we started our fieldwork 20 years back, the indebted woman was not there. Uh, at least not in the same uh, condition as now, and uh, at least not in, in, its, in its current form. And, and what we, we have witnessed somehow its emergence, its gradual fabric. And, and this has allowed us to, to dissect the processes uh, behind the making of this uh, indebted woman. So I don't have much time to enter into the details, but uh, I'm just going to highlight a few uh, things. Um, and uh, our main argument is to say that uh, what is crucial here is the way in which the materiality, uh, kinship, and, and sexuality co-construct each other. So you may be familiar with this famous piece by Gail Rubin, written in the, in the 70s. Um, by kinship, we mean not only a home or his home, but also uh, uh, property rights, um, matrimonial transfers, whether it's dowry or the, or the, or the bride price sexual division of labor, and, and all this in turn um, uh, sh uh, shapes women and, and men's value. By sexuality, women, basically the distinction between uh, respectable sexuality on the one hand, and on the other hand, deviant or trans transgressive sexuality, which in turn have strong consequences um, regarding people's access to material resources. And when your body is controlled, it's of course much more difficult to access material resources. And what we've seen in 20 years is the concomitance of, on the one hand, an increasingly male labor market and what Maria Mies has called the housewifeization uh, of women. Also the gradual transformation of, of sexuality with increasing control over Dalit women's bodies, which was not the case by the past. And, and also the radical transformation of kitchen norms and the fact that men no longer want to marry um, a productive peasant woman, but rather chaste housewives uh, obligated to the king. So in short, uh, 50 years ago, more or less, uh, uh, Tamil women were used to be considered as uh, and valued as economic producers in agriculture and sexually active women. And over the last half century, what we've been observing is that they have gradually transformed into housewives or at least valued as housewives, means that even if they engage into paid work, what matters most to be considered as a good woman uh, is uh, to fulfill your uh, reproductive goal. Uh, so you may ask, uh, what are the consequences for credit, for debt and credit? A number of consequences. The first one is um, the a strong demand for credit. Credit, we have to look at the other side of debt, credit which is the amount of money that is given to you, and which is a kind of, uh, which is kind of a source of recognition 
and, and economic value. And the, the, uh, the only way for them to gain economic value is to, is to borrow money. Uh, I, yeah, I forgot to mention that is, this housewifeization process have to be understood in a context where agriculture is declining. Women, white women used to be very active in agriculture. Uh, so if you look, I don't have the figures here, but more in, in 20 years, uh, the, the percentage of women, Dalit women engaged into paid work has declined by half. Yeah, so this housewifeization process is, is, uh, has, uh, um, is, very, is very clear. But as I was saying, even though a number of them are still engaged into paid work, but in terms of recognition, and it's really the, 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 to be a respectable woman, you, still, you, you, you should stay at home. Uh, and the other, um, so I, I just give you a concrete example. Some years back, I was working with an NGO, which was very much against microcredit, and saying that uh, this NGO historically was uh, working and, and was helping women to defend their rights in education and health, and, and uh, so engage into uh, uh, attempts to transform structural things, no? So they were very much against microcredit, and the women themselves were asking for it, uh, saying that we, uh, we, we don't have jobs anymore. Uh, my credit for us is a way to have a voice in the family. Right? Um, and the other aspect is uh, a strong ethic in payments. Right? Because what was very striking for me was to see that the, uh, whatever the conditions, women pay back. We turn on our forehead, we say. And um, and uh, what came out from our analysis is we're trying to understand this strong ethic of payment. And our uh, uh, analysis suggests that, um, yeah, this ethic of repayment seems to be kind of compensation for their feeling of uselessness, uh, inferiority, and, and, and feeling of guilt. Being a good woman, a good mother, a good wife means being able to borrow money, to manage well your debt, and pay well your debt. I have to be clear that it's, there is nothing new, completely new. I should not romanticize the past. I'm not saying that earlier uh, that women were very happy and, and managing well. Um, and and I'm not, I don't have the time to elaborate, but in, in the book, we, uh, we explain how another criteria which uh, render this credit market very attractive is that it gives the hope to help people, and Dalit in particular, to, to get out from so what we could call a caste debt, mm -hmm. uh, which is also a mix of moral and, and financial debt. But still, it's quite clear that when, when you compare different generations of women, and this is where long-term ethnography was quite useful, uh, it is, seems to us quite clear that this ethic is, is really strengthened further by the economic devaluation of women, which renders them useless mm -hmm. uh, in the eyes of the society. And also this feeling of shame and guilt, uh, which is somehow reinforced by the disposition of their uh, sexuality and the denial of sexual pleasure. I have to be a good woman. You should have sex only uh, to, to have children. Uh, so in the, all the testimony that we, that we got and that we've been trying to talk about in the book, uh, there is really this idea, uh, uh, yeah, this, this feeling of shame and guilt, which comes again and again, and that women talk about to explain why they are paying the, 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 the debt so well. Uh, and, and all those things creating somehow kind of subjectivity of shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. And maybe a, a last point on that. Uh, of course, uh, I'm, what I'm going to say is a bit simplistic, and in the book we try to elaborate this uh, in more details. Uh, of course, Tamil Nadu is not uh, Victorian, in, Victorian England, in England or, or, uh, or 19th century France, but in many ways, what is interesting is to see that uh, the, this Tamil kind of story is, is, is reminiscent of, of, of uh, the slow feminization and, and stigmatization of small credit markets in pre-industrial Europe, uh, described by a number of feminist historians. And the, and, and, and the common point is the emergence of specific kinship norms, assigning men the role of breadwinners, financially independent, and as assigning uh, women to the role of, uh, uh, the role of dependent housewives. Mm -hmm. And with the fact that getting in, in, in this particular ideology, getting into debt to make ends meet becomes degrading, uh, a sign of incompetence, and then left to women. Uh, well, again, we could stop here and say, uh, but there is another aspect that we should talk about. What, what we've seen also over these over this, uh, two decades of fieldwork is transformation of women's bodies, uh, the attitude, 
posture, uh, clothing, way of speaking and, 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 and presenting themselves. And all this, not only, but in part, to build uh, their eligibility uh, for credit. We've also seen the transformation of women's feeling. For instance, uh, women, date women falling in love with their lenders. Um, earlier, I was talking about the corporality of debt. Uh, in a number of cases, women bodies are used as a collateral. Uh, very concretely, but it means that women have to deploy their sexuality, I mean, from smiling, touching, penetration, to negotiate their debt, whether the cost or the repayment terms. So somehow, a uh, kind of sexual exploitation is added to financial exploitation. But again, it's more complicated. Um, and here, I mean, uh, uh, let's take a step back from the Indian case. We, you probably know that Western modernity um, has seen the gradual emergence of beauty as a form of capital especially for women, not only, but especially for women, uh, with arranged marriage uh, becoming less common, uh, looking good is becoming increasingly important for, for having a, a fulfilling sex life. It also has economic benefits. Uh, you have studies from different parts of the world uh, which show that being attractive can help women to find better jobs. Uh, again, this is also true for men, but I think it's uh, especially true for women. If we get back to our family case, we can see that beauty standards, standards have changed. Uh, and and when, when I talk about beauty standards, I talk about how women dress, how they take care of themselves, the skin, how they talk about, uh, how they express themselves, how they move around in public. And, and, and this change is closely related to the development of the credit industry. Um, we also know from uh, thanks to feminist work that love and materiality are closely connected. Uh, consider the work of the sociologist uh, Viviana Zelizer, for instance, and, with, uh, and, and, and also many ethnographies, which clearly demonstrate that love and materiality are connected, um, and that love and desire uh, do not arise spontaneously, but are really more embedded, embedded into specific uh, um, uh, political economies. I'm not saying that, I mean, this does not imply that feelings such as love are, are not genuine, but rather that they are intertwined with, with material concerns. To, to make it more clear, I mean, just as in many contexts, it's no coincidence that nurses fall in love with doctors uh, in a context where debt is so high, uh, it's no coincidence that women fall in love with their lenses. And by following a number of women over for some 10, 15 years, we have witnessed the emergence of relationship, affection and love between women and some of their lenders. So our argument is to say that when the economy depends largely on debt, it is debt that plays a crucial role in shaping bodies, uh, feelings, and also norms of malehood and, and, and femalehood. Our last argument uh, is more a matter of prospection. Um, shall we? Yeah, I forgot what slide, sorry. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the journey, shall we consider that, uh, shall we just consider that is something very wrong and, and bad and that we should abolish all forms of debt? So here our argument is to say that the problem is not debt, but asymmetrical debt. Um, and by asymmetrical debt, we, we, I mean, what do we mean by that? Uh, debt that make individuals or social categories uh, that feel dominated, guilty, or even ashamed of the inferiority they have been assigned. And patriarchal debt is a tragic example of this. And many creditors <laughs> size upon those moral debts to, to, to build the debt system in which only the dominated have to pay. The thing is that there are many other forms of debt. Uh, in, we have a chapter dedicated on that showing that the, this indebted woman is also constantly uh, trying to create uh, circuits, debt circuits. Uh, outside the capitalist market, outside the kitchen roof, with their friends, their neighbors, with their lovers, uh, both for material reasons. I, pay, I borrow money from my friend to pay back my microcredit. I borrow money from my lover to pay back the pawnbroker. I, pay, I borrow money from my sister to pay back uh, my employer and, and, and so forth. 
uh, for material reason, but also to find consult, to, to find care, that attention, sometimes it's love, with again the fact that in those circuits of debts, you always have a combination of emotions and, and, and financial transactions. Of course, those financial circuits have neither the potential nor the ambition to uh, overthrow capitalism or patriarchy, but they do, however, offer a kind of glimpse of the possibility of uh, solidarity-based debts that would be uh, a source of solidarity, equality, and recognition rather than hierarchy, uh, exploitation, and, 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 and humiliation. So again, I'm not saying that we should romanticize those, th those things, but we should just it help us to think uh, about the fact that debt is not a problem, but uh, asymmetrical debt is a problem. Yeah. And maybe more fundamentally, and this is uh, how the book ends, the key issue is to define uh, who is a creditor and who is a debtor. And, and the, the tragedy of this patriarchal debt consists somehow in setting women as perpetual debtors. Whatever you, you do, you're, you're all, you always owe something. Uh, even though those same women uh, assume an infinite number of tasks and obligations. So we have this very paradoxical situation, but I suspect parado paradoxes are, are the heart of patriarchy, where women feel and construct themselves as obligated persons, and the capitalist system draws on this feeling of obligation to keep the financial machine running, particularly with poor and subaltern women, while at the same time, women are constantly fulfilling multiple obligations and services to their families, their children, their husband, and, and so the key, we are really entitled to ask who is a creditor and who is a debtor. And, and shouldn't the situation be reversed? And that's precisely what a number of uh, feminist movements are calling for. Um, so in the, in the conclusion, we, we talk briefly about a number of those movements, which uh, take place in different parts of the world, in, not in India. Uh, and that's a key question. I mean, how can you explain that in some places women are able to mobilize themselves and to claim we are the one who uh, are creditors? Um, and, and, and those struggles are, are, are solitary and it's to be hoped that uh, they will eventually be heard. And we do hope that this book is a kind of modest contribution to this struggle. But uh, maybe just to finish, uh, at the end of our journey uh, with different figures of the indebted women, because as I was saying earlier, bulk part of the book is really focusing on this uh, the fabric of the indebted women in South Africa. Time and again, we try to compare with other places and to show that uh, this uh, indebted woman is in many places, even though she takes different forms depending upon the context and history and, 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 all, and all that. Uh, so just to, to, at the end of our journey, two crucial lessons. Uh, the first one is that this indebted woman is, seems to be a recurring feature, but at the same time, not a foregone conclusion. And here, history and comparison are very uh, useful because they open up the field of possibilities. That's why for us, the Tamil uh, scenario was very interesting because we've, as I was saying earlier, we've, we've seen the emergence of this indebted woman, um, which show that it's, we, it's not a fatality somehow. And, uh, and, uh, and the idea that re reassessing who owes what to whom and, 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 and reversing the stigma of debt is definitely something that must be pursued. And that must go along tackling the norms of uh, kinship and sexuality. I know this is a really abstract and ambitious goal and not very practical, but that shouldn't stop us from declaring it. And so I promise I will stop with this. I mean, uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm repeating myself, but just to make sure that you got the point. Our one of our main arguments is, is, is that the, the female guilt forges shape the figure of this indebted woman. And this guilt really stems from the very definition of the woman, uh, defined as the other, uh, as Simone de Beauvoir uh, already pointed out, as, as someone who is necessarily inferior, dispossessed of her individuality and, and, and sexuality. And uh, since she's at the disposal of, of others, of our kinship group, and, and even of society as a whole. And uh, maybe my last point, we see that the, the struggles against debt and campaigns for financial freedom are, are very much useful for sure, but I'm afraid won't solve anything unless they also address the way that family systems and patriarchal ideologies prevent women from having access to capital, of course, but also control over their own money, over their bodies and, 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 and their sexuality, all sorts of things which keep them trapped 
into this ontological status of, of debtor and, and guilty party. And yes, at the end of the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks, uh, uh, Isabel, for uh, this presentation. Good as the book. I really did enjoy my book. I see a lot of my students in this room, so I did a very good job in sort of uh, uh, conveying uh, my appreciation for the book. So I will not take much time, but I think uh, uh, I'd like to uh, mostly try to brainstorm with you around uh, the ways in which uh, we can situate this book uh, in uh, across a number of contributions that the feminist scholarships is actually doing to debates around credit debt and financialization, which are quite a few, I would say. So, um, so the the book uh, uh, tries to uh, uh, grapple with the, the crucial role played by women in that uh, credit markets and networks, uh, and then contributes uh, uh, to our understanding of. Uh, 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 the workings of uh, the capitalist economy from a gender perspective, but it also quite uh, um, uh, originally from the point of view of uh, 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 sex, sex work uh, and uh, capitalism, which instead is the less talked about uh, issue in this uh, literature that tries to gender uh, uh, capitalism. The relation between credit debt and gender has been recently, uh, in the last decade or so, uh, a key concern of different strands of feminist uh, scholarships. Uh, and the first literature that comes to mind uh, is the literature on the financialization of social reproduction. Uh, in the words of Adrienne Roberts and others have tried to theorize this with reference to, for instance, countries in the global north. Um, there's work by uh, by by Adrian. There's work by John Montgomery, who used to be a king's. Uh, uh, and uh, while there is an attention to the global north, I would say that in the global south we use a different grammar to talk about very similar things when we look at uh, uh, processes of privatization of public utilities and the impact uh, on men and women, but women in particular. I'm thinking here about the work of Patrick Bond, but also Ruth Hall with reference to South Africa. And a lot of work has been done, for instance, on water and what the privatization of water, now recently also on electricity, which type of knock-on effects this have on households and how women navigate these uh, issues. Uh, the second uh, rising literature on uh, uh, um, on this is uh, trying to grapple with what uh, I can define as a sort of contemporary avatars uh, of the coloniality of labor and debt relations, uh, which I think lately the literature of microcredit has picked up with reference to India. And my highlight would be, for instance, the work by Smita Radhakrishnan, among others. Although, uh, to say, this is uh, a literature on the ways in which that uh, uh, and labor relations combine or in their interlocked ways actually have traveled to the contemporary that in my view remain quite male oriented. And instead, there is a lot there to uh, unpack. So of course, one is already hinting at what uh, this book contribution is to that particular literature. And the third is that the link between uh, uh, debt, debt crisis with the big D, right, the boys talk at the micro level, the macro level, when we talk about uh, sort of uh, uh, um, a, a processes that affect national government and undermine sovereignty, we are witnessing a massive new wave of indebtedness, uh, particularly following uh, uh, the pandemic. And uh, so we sometimes read some of the highlights from uh, the UNDP or the World Bank, and you have this sense, wow, am I getting back to the 90s or something? There's a number of countries that are actually very close to the defaulting. 
And I would say that here, highlighting the linkages between macro and macro micro linkages is very important. Something that, as uh, uh, Isabella has mentioned, uh, quite a few feminists have taken at heart. For instance, Lu Lucy Caballero and Veronica Gago's uh, uh, feminist reading of that would be a case in point. So, in my view, the book contributes to all these three different uh, 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 literatures, directly or indirectly, through the concept of the sexual division of debt. Uh, not only in highlighting how women incur debt differently from men, but how they are key agents when it comes to repayments, uh, regardless of the members of the family that actually contracted this debt in the first place. Uh, what Roberts have called, uh, with reference to the Global North, the process of caring for debt. So who cares for this debt, who's just more committed to the uh, repayment? Second, I would say that uh, in terms of uh, the ways in which uh, the coloniality of labor relations that manifest, uh, I see this uh, the book contributing massively to that via the uh, um, process whereby uh, the book maps uh, how uh, the housewifeization that we see specifically in the type of households uh, that uh, the book covers uh, um, have uh, uh, mainstream this ideology of the house which is exactly what Maria Mies was talking about in the 80s uh, as a colonial import uh, to uh, uh, sort of then uh, uh, amplify specific ways in which then uh, the housewife becomes the key agents of dealing with uh, the reproductive economies, including a number of uh, economic relations within that. And moreover, finally, this will be the third uh, reference to the third literature. He introduces the key element of novelty that is the attention to the way in which uh, sex, uh, sex and sexuality and uh, to an extent sexual violence, right? Like in the case of Gago and Caballero interplays uh, in complex ways with that, that relations. He interplays in ways which facilitate access to credit in some cases, or as part of the very debt repayment uh, in other ways, still in ways that might not compromise the respectability of the subject of debt so that you always have a sense that they need to make sure that this is differentiated itself from gift or prostitution. So it's a part of a complex moral and caring economy, uh, and the sexual division of that uh, uh, then also applies to these complex processes. So it's not just uh, what we generally refer to when dealing with uh, uh, sort of the uh, uh, processes of uh, gendered uh, uh, um, uh, credit or debt relations. So not just the structural aspect, but also the emotional aspect that uh, uh, Isabel uh, mentioned in the presentation. So uh, I had a huge number of questions exactly based on how I see the book situated at the intersections uh, of these three different types of literature, in my view. Uh, but of course, because uh, I, I have the privilege of spending a lot of time with Isabel, I think uh, mo uh, many of them I could ask her after. For this audience, I think uh, I'll just uh, uh, focus on those that I feel can sort of uh, 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 make us think in different directions uh, 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 in the room, uh, from uh, theory to methods to um, then uh, politics and, and well, policy uh, uh, as well. So on the one hand, uh, um, um, thinking with your concept of the sexual division of debt, the woman emerges as a subject of uh, a debt that is actually never repayable, which I think you mentioned also several times in the book. So this debt is never to be repaid. It's not possible to repay. And I wonder uh, if uh, we can think about how we can scale up this concept and reflection, uh, considering that new debt crisis and debates on reparations on abolition at the, you know, if we return, you, you've done a good job to just take David Graber's work and take it down to South Harcourt, but can we do the opposite? So we learn about the unpayability of this debt and what does it mean for some of the political debates around debt that we are uh, having at the moment. And also the uh, what is uh, the indebted woman 
saying about the role of sex work in capitalism, not just the role of sex and gender in capitalism, but the role of sex work in capitalism, because this takes me back to early debates in the 1970s, uh, the work of Leopoldina Fortunati and others, uh, stressing how housework has always to, uh, must always include sex work in uh, his point of reference. And in terms of the methods, I think they're really interesting, the methods used here. And you use this uh, um, method of the financial diary, which I think you touched upon, but uh, I would be, uh, it would be very uh, uh, good for all our students present here if you could talk uh, uh, more about it. And also, for instance, uh, the relations with other feminist methodologies like uh, time use, uh, that would be... Um, uh, for me, very interesting. And uh, what would be um, uh, possible policy? I, I know it's difficult when you have such a rich ethnography and the argument is so substantial to take down to discuss actions uh, that might be uh, smaller, right? There's smaller politics involved, but uh, which type of uh, uh, policy actions uh, uh, can you think of in support of the indebted woman? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I give you five minutes. So this is more like a brainstorming. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you five minutes to grapple with some of these things and then I uh, uh, open to the um, questions. Uh, I don't have, uh, yes, Aben will just take the questions online and I'll just uh, take a question from the room. Maybe we do two and two. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. Uh, I will start maybe with the easiest one, the financial diary. Uh, so you asked me to give more details. So the financial diary is, is very simple. It's very difficult to implement, but it's quite simple. You just sit with a household and you're trying to measure how much money is coming in and what it, where did it come from and whether it comes from labor, whether it comes from debt, whether it comes from gift, whatever, and who is taking care of, who is, who is getting it, and then who is managing it, and, and then uh, same work with expenses. Uh, so it's, uh, on paper, it's very simple. In practice, it's much more complicated. So we have colleagues who have been trying to do that by giving notebooks to people. In our case, it didn't work at all. I mean, people are very busy at first um are not compatible with uh, writing um and the key thing is that in the number of households uh, you have a number of uh, financial hidden circuits um i am saving money with my neighbor i am saving money under the mattress and and this is this is true for women this is true for husbands this is true for children so having a notebook uh, which would make this transparent is simply unthinkable uh, so uh, one colleague, uh, research assistant, spent a lot of time in the household observing what, go what was going on and, and asking questions. And at the end, we don't claim to have everything because this is simply impossible and it will also raise ethical questions. Uh, but we, so we have some sort of reasonable idea. And, and, and surprisingly, I mean, this method have been, uh, has a long history. Uh, it was uh, renewed recently by uh, Jonathan Mordek and his colleagues in Bangladesh, South Africa, North India, and in the US. Surprisingly, I mean, the work is great, it's, it's fascinating, but surprisingly, there was nothing about gender. So I really don't understand how they manage to get those figures, but that's another question. <laughs> um, and, I, and, and I would say, I mean, uh, we, we embarked and we started this without making sure, I mean, a lot of work, and it's also, you know, it's. Uh, it also raises ethical questions. We spend a lot of time in this in the households, and you really have to use the kind of the role of ethnography. I mean, you stay there just only provided that you give something back, not 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 materially, but, that, uh, but through conversation, through discussion, and, and at, at some point you become part of the family, and people like to talk to you, and and, and they give you uh, they, they they confide to you, and 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 that's the only way. Uh, the only otherwise you cannot do that. No. Uh, what I was I wanted to say that initially we're not sure that something will get out from this, but yes, uh, and and something which is very clear that the, uh, the specialization of women in repayment came out from this, simply because even though we already spend a lot of time doing ethnography, um, these kind of things uh, women don't talk about it, male don't talk about it because it's it's kind of public secret. 
And, uh, and we had to do this kind of work to really to, to realize to, what, to which extent uh, women were really in charge of those uh, part of the debt process. Uh, well, first question, how do we, how do we scale this up? I mean, I'm probably, my answer is probably going to be very disappointing because it's very abstract. But for me, the, the major issue behind this ontology, I mean, it's a matter of ontology. I mean, for me, what is very problematic is um, a way of thinking in which uh, people are considered as uh, independent. And, and it should be, uh, uh, it's more a matter of, it's both a matter of um, looking at things and it's both a matter of thinking what should be done. Right? So this famous image of the bread, male breadwinner, right? you, are, you, are, you, are, um, you should be financially independent and you should be, uh, you should not depend upon anyone, right? which is completely false, as we know, because uh, and people who are the most dependent are especially men in the first place, because without caring and without this and that, they won't survive a single day. Um, and, and the problem is, uh, is when you start thinking of an uh, uh, ideal world where people could be free for all those kinds of social independences, then borrowing money to make and meet becomes something decreating. Well, if you think of, you know, if you think of a world where social inter interdependencies are recognized, because without those things the world wouldn't survive, not only are recognized but should be valorized, uh, but also should be valorized, then this the stigma on, on death disappears. I know it's very abstract and it's, it's, we're not going to do that tomorrow, but this is the kind of answer I would, uh, which is a bit different also uh, compared to Graeber, but uh, we can come back to Graeber. Uh, in terms of policies, that of course, it's always a big question, and uh, I think there are different levels, I would say. I mean, with my colleagues, uh, Santosh Kumar and the Council Romanian, we are in touch regularly with financial companies, and, and uh, it's, it's, very, it's very tricky because you don't want to hear these kind of things. But they're not stupid, and they know that uh, uh, something is going wrong. Uh, and um, uh, at the same time, and this is where we don't talk about that in the book, but we, it's crucial to look at the entire picture. Those financial organizations are also part of a long chain, and they also have their own constraints. It was very clear during the uh, COVID time where debt has boomed like anything, and but 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 financial providers were also. Uh, in trouble um, because uh, big banks were getting uh, subsidy and, and many uh, arrangement and flexibility from the Indian government. But those financial companies who are dealing with the poor were also struggling very much. So uh, you see, you have to look at the entire chain to see what's possible. But, uh, so coming back to the, uh, I'm not answering to your question, but um, we have been trying to talk about what about writing off? Okay. Of course, it won't solve the entire problem because, as I, you remember the figures I told you, without that, people won't just die in a two days, in a few days, no? Because they, I mean, you look at income uh, at, 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 at cash flows, uh, income are, uh, debt is even more important than income. But, but so writing off could be only temporary uh, options. But uh, the thing is that, and here we are back to gravel aspects. Uh, it's simply impossible for financial providers in the Indian case to think about the fact that a well, woman's debt could be cancelled. You know, if you start thinking, and I, my, my suspicion is that well, we, when we put the, that on the table, you know, they were looking at each other, a bit embarrassed, and because they were unable to give any proper answer. And our feeling was that uh, there is really this idea that the poor and the poor women should pay back their debt. Well, I mean, in India, I don't know how familiar you are with India, but writing off is, has a long history. It's a huge amount of money. And, but here, so we have a case which is uh, you just cancel the debt of one particular big company. And with this same amount of money, you will cancel the debt of all the women we're talking about. But it's not part of the imagination. And I mean, we're in a context where uh, I think the, the fear of a systemic collapse is, is really a, a, a at stake, since uh, those clients, I mean, women as clients don't have any collateral. If you stop, if you start defaulting, then the entire system can collapse. 
uh, I also think that uh, you know when we have this kind of discussion with those uh, people, uh, yeah, yeah, we know that they are struggling, but we are the only one to lend them money, uh, which is not true because, as I was saying earlier, borrowing money from the formal so-called formal market is only a small part of the story. In informal debt is, is still very much high. Um, uh, so at least to say that uh, trying to do something in terms of in terms of uh, policy is very uh, very tricky, and, and and there is also apart from our conversation with uh, Indian financial companies, we also have conversation with I mean people at the World Bank or this kind of uh, organization. And always the answer is always the same. At, at some, at the, in, in, yeah, for the moment it's problematic, and and and, but it's but this is the way to go, uh, because 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 people need financial services, and uh, for the moment they are it's a bit struggling to to do this properly. But with financial education, it will go well, and once they will be educated, everything will go well. Um, so I, always to say that we are trying to discuss with those people, but it's. Thanks a lot. I'll open now to uh, Q and A. Yes, I already have uh, two there, <laughs> so taken. Uh, we have a question uh, from the chat, so I'll take these two and then uh, one from the chat, and then we do another round. Thank you. I saw you though. So, yeah, Fatima. Well, okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Isabel, for your presentation and also Ali for situating the book uh, because I haven't read the book yet. So my question is. Um, I'd like to know your insights on um, the online new debt. It's like very, which is very uh, friendly rising, especially for this, for instance in Indonesia, which people borrow money from the untrusted company, financial companies. Most of most of most of them not registered, and they just like they, they should repay the debt uh, with big amount of interest. So do you, do you have the insight on that? Yeah, a second question then. Yeah. Uh, Yes, so I have two questions. So first on land, uh, what is the land situation uh, with the with these women and which social class are they from? And sometimes um, with microfinancing, they could fall into, they ended up giving the land to a certain accumulation of individuals. Um, and also what type of uh, society are there? Because sometimes you also have a communal land, not, not privatization in a Western context. Um, and second is on housewife, because I, I think Maria Mice, uh also, uh, her her views, from, if I'm not mistaken, probably a different way of a family structure, instead of um, uh, in the global south, maybe the housewife, you, you have to do a social production for like 20 people in your household. So what what sort of uh, housewife communication that in such deal? Uh, question is it, is it a man and then on the children or is it more of a global south context? Thank you very much. Can we take yeah. another question from Don? How do you feel of the invested women relating to racial capitalism? How do you see patriarchy interact with racial capitalism as already expressed by Stuart Hall in the Turkey province? Thank you. Great question. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Uh, digital debt. Yeah, when we were doing this, we thought the, when the book was released one year back. So it means that it was written even earlier. And uh, so digital debt was not very much there at that time. Uh, it's starting. Uh, for the moment, I suspect it's more uh, targeting young men. Uh, so I'm, I've been talking again and again about the gender of debt. We should not forget that a number of men are also indebted. And, and I'm not saying that it's only a gender problem. Uh, so I think in the Indian context, at least for the moment, uh, we're talking about women in the in, in rural villages, and uh, it's just starting, but it's not very much there yet. But I have a colleague working in Vietnam, for instance, which is it is boom like anything, and with I mean, uh, and, and here the collateral is your social network basically. So if you don't pay back well, your uh, images and, and very bad things will be um, spread in, in, in your social network. 
so you even have a number of people who have started um, groups to try to uh, defend themselves against these kind of things. But yeah, all this to say that the digital stuff is really opening new um, avenues for other kind of exploitation, including sexual exploitation. Yeah. Um, then, yeah, of course, it's a crucial question. Then, so we are in a context where uh, um, uh, there is a kind of overlap, where it's a big debate, but between caste and class divide, and and very much connected to, to land ownership. And uh, very clearly, uh, there is over the last twenty years, according to our figures, uh, there is increasing concentration of land ownership. Uh, an increasing number of people are losing land or selling land, and a significant part of this is because of debt. It's very quite difficult to measure it because people will hardly tell you that they have sold their land to pay back a debt because it's very shameful. But through again through ethnography, we can see that uh, there is a strong connection between debt and uh, and and uh, the fact that people are losing land. Again, I would have, uh, emphasize the fact that it's not, not, not only because of microcredits. Uh, yeah, microcredit is part of the story, but I mean, according to our figures, if you look at the household level, uh, microcredits may represent something like 20, 30 percent of household debt on average, which means that uh, there are many other players and uh, yeah, microfinan microcredit is not the only uh, culprit. I would say. Uh, housewife, yes, uh, yeah, we are, so we are in a context where you have an increasing number of so-called nuclear families, which is increasingly the norm, but increasingly does not mean that it is a majority, so yes, in a, I don't have the figures in mind, but I, if I remember well, it might be something like 40, 60, I mean, 40 percent of nuclear family, and uh, it's when white and kids, 70 percent of uh, extend families with different generation with of course strong consequences in terms of housework and the number of and given the fact that um when I'm saying that uh the indebted woman is uh not only borrowing a lot of money compared to her income but also paying back part of her husband's debt she's also paying back the debt of her uh, brother-in-law uh, father-in-law, and and uh, we have few cases like that. Even when she does not live with within an extended family, uh, so we have to make a distinction between uh, how people live and, but also and the, the kind of interconnection and interdependencies. So the cases that I have in mind are not living together, but they're just living around. And um, yeah, and uh, I, I didn't have. I'm not sure I was clear regarding this kinship thing, but then it gives me an opportunity to give you maybe give you additional words. Uh, when I'm talking about the shift, radical shift in kinship norms, I'm uh, saying that yeah, men don't want anymore to marry um, uh, female peasants, peasants, uh, but they're rather rather looking for uh, good-looking women who are chaste and respectable and and who are going to do good domestic work, and this goes along with a radical shift. Uh, regarding matrimonial payments. And by the past, it was the so-called bride price system where the parents of the, of, the, of the boy are paying, are giving money to the parents of the girl. And this is now the complete opposite. Um, yeah, so just to give it, I realized maybe it was not clear in my presentation, uh, like that this, uh, when I was talking about radical shift in kidship, this has very strong material consequences. And the very fact that women are completely devalued as economic agents means that we have to pay to get married to 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 to, to uh, uh, Racial capitalism. I'm not an expert in racial capitalism, but the only, only thing I could say is that um, uh, the fact that women are indebted is not the consequences of capitalism. The fact that women are indebted is the pillar of financial capitalism. It might be a common point. Is racial capitalism where, if I understand well, race is 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 at the core of capitalism. Thanks a lot. So uh, we have already set another round and already one for the round after. So I have uh, first uh, yes over there. That's going to be next round, I'm afraid. Then I have Jens and I have uh, second row. 
sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, and then we're gonna take one from the um, from the chat. And then after I've, I've seen various people, but yeah, they'll have to wait a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so again, I'd like to start by thanking you for the presentation. Uh, uh, and I've also not read the book yet, uh, but my question is, with regard to um, a certain policy level implication, especially for, uh, based on, uh, I'm from India, and um, do I have some experience um, working with some of the traditional street artists in Delhi? Mm -hmm. So these would be acrobats um, and musicians, etc. And and the women there, uh, you mentioned of again repaying that. So there were instances of of daughters repaying the debt for incurred during their mother's wedding. So the like generations of repayment. And when we sort of looked at the amounts that were being passed on, they would have already repaid the amount and interest many times over. But the lenders still insist that the debt has not been repaid yet. And at some level, the government has recognized this. And the, what the government is doing is pushing a lot of literacy in general and financial literacy uh, in particular. Um, and also uh, trying to get them more included in the uh, formal banking sector instead of these informal lending practices. But how much of a solution do you think this is? Will this actually lead to anything? We've been trying this for some time as in the attempts at financial literacy. That is one question. And, and secondly, about our debt write-offs, uh, and I think Sainath is one person who's been writing about this like over and over again and speaking about this for a long time. Um, but even in general, within the public sphere, we have uh, some sort of a, a huge hesitance to even you know, um, accept the idea of write-offs when it comes to people like farmers or from people from the informal economy. But at the same time, there are there seem to be no uh, the shock value associated with the figures of write-offs for corporates at the at every year that shock value seems to have gone down. There seems to be an acceptance in the public sphere that, oh, the corporates will incur debt and this will be written off. In such a situation, where do we even begin the conversation? Uh, what do you think uh, should happen then? Thank you. Second row. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, I think your research is extremely valuable, especially uh, when we look at historical material of debt and labor, there's hardly any narratives about women. In, in the case of Sudan, my research site, it's usually male trader lending money to male farmers. And there's no narrative around women. So it makes me think about maybe, you know, women were the one repaying, repaying the, the debt. And um, my question is internal valuation among Dalit women. Um, you, you have already sort of explored uh, differences among them, but what about um, any generational differences? What about being accountable in the relationship differences? Because I suppose there is a difference in how different generation of women take up on social difficulties. Uh, thank you. I had yes. Yes. So I, I really enjoyed reading the book. I, it, it, it's really a special book because, and, and maybe it has to be. It, it's no surprise because based on 20 years of field work. But, but it's also the kind of insights that both at the micro, micro level of individuals and the big picture all together. And then of course, debt and how it works, including sexuality and a proper understanding of the changing role of, of women as capitalism develops in India. That's just so much, it's, 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 it's hard to, to sort of stop. But, but in all that, I, so, one thing that, that, that struck me, well, there are many things that struck me, but one thing that, that was really striking was how men and women, uh, the Dalit men and women within households seems to go into very different directions. When men were stuck in, in not particularly good jobs, women were forced out of the, the, the labor market and therefore ended up working. Uh, uh, with debt, debt instead. And in most cases, men would not touch their debt. It was the women's debt. And, and, they, and so, so, so what is left of, uh, on, of, of, uh, of the household, of the, of the marriage, uh, as we uh, 
as we're reaching a stage where 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 the kind of work that is done, the kind of economies that exist, the kind of sexual uh, 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 orientations, i.e., who 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 do women uh, who do Dalit women sort of focus on for their the, in relation to their sexuality. And what 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 do the men that they're married to do? It all seems to diverse or uh, diverge away from each other. Is this the end of the of the of, of, of the household as a as a unit? We'll take one question from the online space and then we'll give you two minutes to answer all these questions. <laughs> <laughs> Did any of the indebted women you may say that they consider the fact that they can take on debt in a positive way as an expression of agency or freedom, or uh, was it always seen as a blind or as a burden, as a bind or as a burden? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so let me start with the last question. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. Maybe I didn't have the time to elaborate, but what is very ambivalent with this debt thing is that it's ambivalent. And the only thing I was saying uh, related to that was the fact that there is a strong demand for it. And I'm talking about a number of NGOs who didn't want to step into that. But women were in demand. We need this to get recognition. So there are a lot of expectation. And uh, also what I was saying at some point was the fact that in order to get, uh, yeah, to, to, to get some recognition at the household level, you have to be indebted. So it gives them some recognition. It gives them some room of manoeuvre to, 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 to spend uh, according to their own wish. Uh, education and taking care of the kids and, and most of the time not for their own um, interest but rather for the, for the family uh, and uh, also this the fact that um, it's not only to put food on the table it's also to uh, ma to marry uh, the kids properly I mean there is really this idea that they want a better future for the children education marriages uh, better housing and the, the in, in some cases it works but at which cost? So uh, we're in a context where there are a lot of social aspirations for Dalit community, and and it's moving. I mean, the gap with the with the upper with the non dalit is is still very high, and I'm afraid it's maybe increasing depending upon what kind of material you, you take. But it's true that I mean, you know, over the last twenty years, we have seen better houses, we have seen uh, Dalit kids going to private schools. Uh, we don't mean that they get jobs, but at least they have educated. Uh, so a number of women are quite happy with that, but they are the ones who are paying the full price of this kind of sort of social mobility is too much, but kind of integration. Uh, so this is a point what that I make, and, and which may, which explain that a number of women are quite, are quite proud, but to, to which cost? I mean, I mean, uh, tiredness and depression and anxiety. We never came across a uh, suicide case, but I suspect there are many. Uh, so it's still the limits of, despite doing 20 years of field work, there are a number of things that we've missed. Uh, the end of the household being, uh, as a unit, well, it's a good question. Uh, but this, uh, the only thing I would say, it gives me an opportunity to say, to talk about uh, men suffering, because this breadwinner story is very tough for men. I mean, in a context where you don't have any proper job, being supposed to be uh, being being uh, expectation regarding your role as a breadwinner, uh, so we have we haven't well we were criticized not talking sufficiently about men, but we have few cases talking about the fact that for men it's very tough, and they know I mean they keep their, they, they they close their eyes, but they know quite well the kind of dealing that their women that wives are I mean the fact that their wife are using their body I mean they're not stupid no. Um, so apart from saying that, I, I don't know what to say. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't answer to those questions. Difference in terms of generation? That's what the question is. Yeah, I don't have much to say about urban because I don't know much about urban, but very clearly, I mean, there is a different uh, a gap in terms of generation. I just give you an example where we, we, we know the grandmother and who, who always uh, laugh at her daughter, who is now 15, uh, saying that, look, it's, yeah, I have nice salary, and, and uh, you go this and there, and, and, uh, but, uh, uh, but you don't laugh anymore. Uh, because to be respectable, you have to be, you know, to keep quiet, you have to take care of your house, 
And uh, this, her mother is saying, oh, when I was young, I was shouting and, and, and you know, laughing and making jokes and, and talking about sex openly. And now you, you just keep quiet. Very sad and very boring. You're very boring as a person. So this is just a quick example to show you the, the differences. It's a very interesting example. I have already a huge number of questions. I have Simran, Abhishek, and uh, um, Bifro here. So I'm afraid that's going to be it. I'll, we finish at the 6.30 period, yes? So uh, I'll just have you all ask your questions and take one from the um, uh, online space and uh, you will answer those that you feel like answering and carry with you for further reflections, most likely those that um, maybe take uh, uh, longer. So pitch your question shortly and uh, in a sexy way so that your question is picked. Simran first. <laughs> Thank you so much for the session. And um, I wanted to ask you, um, have you, uh, how does indebtedness specifically um, impact sex workers in India? And also if you have noticed any um, debt system trends, uh, which are starkly different for sex workers as compared to other marginalized communities? Yeah, yeah. Keep it very short. Uh, just did you find any relation with the uh, migration and the independence of the Dalit women? Because how this shapes the yeah. individual aspirations of these women for the migration. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Thanks a lot for the talk. My question is about you said there is a connection between debt and social net worth, and I was wondering how this embodiedness from lender and borrower to lovers is actually affecting women's net worth within the community is they, are they seen differently if they follow those like romantic affairs and are they really romantic and we take one from the uh, online space yes um, hi this question is related to debt but in the paradigm of widowers i read about shipwrecks in mm -hmm. india sure. pakistan and bangladesh recently an industry was full of young males with young families. If they happen to pass away in the workplace, the widows have to bear the responsibility. Would you know of any organization that could aid women financially, or if there's organizations that aid women to offload the debt burdens, either financially or with education systems? Thank you. I will let you pick. Yeah, yeah. So we'll have a few minutes before the end. And then... uh, migration, this is a very important question. Uh, there is a clear connection between debt and migration. Uh, internal migration, uh, I have too much debt. I send my son to the city, uh, expecting him to pay back the debt. Uh, so again, it's uh, give you an opportunity to talk about the fact that men are not completely absent. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, this is crucial. This is crucial and, and, and it explains the fact that the debt can be, is somehow sustainable. Women are paying a lot for the fit, but men are also paying their part, and migration is a way to solve it. Uh, yeah. Um, inheritance and the fact that uh, that is transmitted to the next generation, it also gives me an opportunity to answer to your question that I forgot. And here, I have um, two things, no? Uh, and you were also asking about formal and how far uh, being able to borrow money from the bank can help. Could help. And here my point would be to really um, go against this division between formal debt and informal debt. There is this idea that formal would be good and transparent and la la la, and informal would be only dangerous, exploitative, la la, and that's not true. Uh, bankers can be as bad or even worse in a number of cases compared to informal lenders. Informal lenders, they have to follow certain rules, otherwise they just, they're gonna sustain. I don't think informal lenders are good. I'm just saying that there is a huge diversity of situations. And the fact that uh, informal lenders are depicted as, as villains and, and the bad guys is always in history, it's all, always been a, an argument to justify the bad practices of the bank system. So, but uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and in some cases, uh, formal debt are transmitted, while informal debt are not, or vice versa. And, and there is no strict rule. Uh, but uh, and in our own uh, uh, 
the party region, uh, there are many different cases, and in, in some situations, uh, lenders, even lenders are quite flexible and, and, and will understand and will uh, stop uh, harassing people when someone dies, but you know, others will not, and the same for formal uh, organization. Uh, I have to stop. If you want, people can have one sheet. <laughs> Sex work, I don't have any, the only context where officially sex work does not exist. It's there, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't have any, I, I don't have any specific to say on that. So maybe it was a stupid uh, idea to answer this question because I'm unable to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Social network, uh, what is interesting is that uh, it's very difficult to to be con to, to, to have a convincing argument in, in a short period of time when I was, Telling you that we have seen women falling in love with their lovers. A question I've always, I, you were saying, is it really romantic? A, a question we always have. Do they really love their husband? I mean, do, we, do you really love your husband? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult to answer. But what, what's very clear is that, uh, you know, the situation was always the same. At the, at the beginning, a woman is highly indebted to a guy. And then at some point she says, okay, this guy is lending me money. I have to give something back on top of the money. She's, she's paid properly. So when I'm talking about this uh, subjectivity of, of guilt and shame, I have to give something back. He's trusting me uh, while I am a useless person. So I have to give something back. And the only thing I have to give, I can give back is my body. So this is about starting point. So they start having sex and being very feeling very guilty because they they they, they have a strong ethic as a woman they should be and uh, especially with this all this ideology of housewifeization and all that. So our story started with women telling us and telling in particular to one of the, my colleagues Santosh, what should I do? Because if I stop borrowing money from that guy, I'm lost. My 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 bankrupt. At the same time, I have to give something to this guy because he's expecting something. I don't know whether it's true or not, but she's feeling like that. And so the first year, she's really feel ashamed and crying, and uh, and then telling us, yeah, but this guy's nice. He's, he's, he's believing. He's trusting me. Uh, my husband is not. Uh, and 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 we really have the feeling that after, over time, some sentiments are emerging. And uh, but the end of the story is to say that, yeah, it's not because you have money that you cannot have love. And that I suspect that in many circumstances, the two are strongly connected. We don't want to see that because we still believe in romantic love, but I'm afraid that it's everywhere it's completely connected. Silvia oh, Federici used to say, they call it love, we call it unpaid labor. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think it's a very apt uh, way to end the yeah. seminar and uh, help me sort of really uh,